Well, hey, welcome to the message. Here at Colonial Church, we're all about loving God, loving people, and loving life. We pray that this message would be practical and inspiring for you in your everyday life. God bless you. How are you doing? So good to be here. So I'm the second choice, I know. <laughs> it's great. I love Florida. I love this part of Florida. I've never been up here before, but I'm fall, uh, falling in love to San Agustin. What a great city you have. It's awesome to be here. And uh, the weather in Sweden is like in its 40s. And uh, so for me, this is the heaven to come here. Warm weather, good food, nice people, and a great church. <laughs> That's awesome. So good. So the mo- you can sit down. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think uh, you must be the most spiritual people. You're up early, 5 o'clock praying, and go into the first service, 9 o'clock a.m. service. That's amazing. Uh, and it's great. I went up also. I wake up, woke up like 5 o'clock this morning, prayed and fasted, uh, and... Actually, you maybe believe that I'm the, I'm the most spiritual people, but I'm jet lagged. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so good to be here. I really enjoy Matt and uh, Jill's company. I haven't known them so long, but I love their heart for people, the heart for the house, and what a great thing you're building here. Uh, what a great pastors you are, you have. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I've been traveling around the world with Andrew and myself also, doing this, uh, talking to kingdom builders all over the globe. And I actually never seen this many kingdom builders in a house in, at this early stage. And I'm, I'm really impressed about you doing here. And you're having a great building, lease, option to buy it. I mean, it's a miracle of the four years. Uh, congratulations to all of you. I mean, it's amazing. Yes, I'm here from Sweden, and uh, can, can I start with a prayer? <laughs> Is that okay? Do we pray in this church? <laughs> we do, that's great. Yeah, dear Lord, I just want to pray and lay this, uh, this first service in your hands, and I pray that you, Holy Spirit, anoint the words I'm speaking today, so it's words from you into our hearts, into our spirits, into our future. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm a businessman. I have a property development company, so I buy land, I subdivide, I build buildings and sell. And then I'm also a part of Hillsong Sweden, where I oversee the Kingdom Builder side together with my, with my pastor, Andreas Nilsson, who is a great guy and good friend of mine. So I'm really honored to, to be here and to be able to do this. And today's message is about the promised land. I'm going to talk how to live in the promised land. And uh, if you remember the Bible, uh, you remember that there, uh, the Jews were slaves in Egypt. And Moses was called to release his people to the promised land. So he, God did a lot of miracles through Moses and he divided the sea and everything. And a lot of the people... They didn't obey him, so they had to walk in the desert for over 40 years. And only two of the original people came into the promised land. And what is the promised land then? I think it's a place full of blessings. The Bible says it's a place full of honey and milk. It's a place full of favor, timing, wisdom, and it's a place of freedom, freedom for us. And all of you understand now that I'm talking about Sweden. That is the promised land, and so is San Agustin. I think the truth is we can run our lives in the desert, even if we're Christians. We can also run our lives in the, in, in the promised land. And through Jesus, we are sons and daughters. We are family. We are God's children through Jesus. So we are always welcome home into the promised land, whatever you do. I like funny. Is that okay uh, to be that we can laugh a little bit? I have a Swedish story. Actually, I don't know if it's funny in English, but I, I translated it. Uh, so I hope you get it. Is it okay that I read this? Because it's a little bit difficult for me. Uh, it's, it's a complex story, but it's funny then. And if you don't get the point, laugh anyway, please. 
Help me out. Is that okay? Yeah. Ah, great. Two men were riding together in a car when the driver ran a red light and the passenger said, do you realize you just run a red light? And the driver said, relax. My brother and I always run red lights. And then the driver ran another red light and turned to the passenger and said, relax. My brother and I always run red lights. And the passenger was relieved to see that the next light was green. But to his surprise, the driver came to a scratching halt. And he turned to the driver and said, man, what's the matter with you? You run two red lights and excuse it by saying that you and your brother always run red lights. Then you come to a green light and stop. Why is that? And the driver calmly responded, well, I have to stop at green lights because I never know when my brother might be coming a dice down a side street. <laughs> Amazing. I believe that we have a higher success rate when we stop at red lights. And it's the same. It's a higher success rate when we, when we live in the promised land and, and being part of the promised land instead of walking in the desert. And I want to I tell you, share a little bit my story today, how I went from slavery, that's why I have the picture, into the desert, and finally found freedom. Is that okay? I share a little bit myself. I was, uh, I was uh, born in Sweden. I had a quite rough upbringing. Both my parents had drinking problems. So I could come home from school when I was like six, seven years old, and there was money lying, laying on the table, and I had to buy food myself, and they could be gone for days, sometimes weeks, and I didn't know if they were coming back or not. And of course, you understand that that created a lot of insecurity in me. It was, uh, I was, uh, had low self-esteem, and I created, when I've been thinking back, I created a really poor belief system. I'm almost ashamed of admit how poor it was. It was like, if I become rich, I will be happy. That was my, my belief system. And I grew up, I was, uh, I couldn't, uh, you know, handle life so well. I became a rebel. I, di I didn't uh, finish school. I, I, I missed a lot of school years uh, from primary school. And uh, I was doing a lot of bad stuff. But then, you know, I couldn't find happiness in my life. And I, I didn't know what to do. But the, the thought of becoming rich really resonated in me. So I... In Sweden, we have something uh, called uh, like a second chance. If you miss school, you can actually redo school again, reread re it a couple of years later. And uh, the, the worst grades you have, the easier it is to get into the school. So I was admitted right this. <laughs> I just said, yeah, I want to do it. And they said, yeah, you're in, you're in, Henry. So I was really, really focused and intense in my studies. I got good grades really good grades, and applied to one of the top business schools in Europe. It's called Stockholm School of Economics, and got admitted, like the first in all our family line in generations that got into a school like that. And I, I went in there and did good, uh, studied good, but I still had all those insecurities and... Uh, and uh, low self-esteem and so on. So it didn't cure it. After that, I went into sales and built a big sales organization where I had a, a lot of people around me and I did well. I earned a lot of money. And then suddenly, there was a guy I got friends with and he, he started to speak, talk to me about Jesus. And I, I was, uh, uh, he was good and I, I listened to him, but I didn't, you know, I didn't care so much. And then one day he gave me a Bible, the New Testament. And I promised in a weak moment that I would re read it from the beginning till end. And how I regretted it. <laughs> you know, it started with 500 names, it felt like. Uh, Abraham was the father of Jacob. Isaac was, uh, you know, and so on. I don't remember the names, but, you know, I felt it was like a long genealogy book. And, but I read it through anyway. I read the whole Bible. And Jesus stood out for me. It was like, he was, some things he said was like unbelievable. He said, follow me and I will make you fishes of men. And I was thinking, that's exactly what I say to my sales rep when I hire them. Uh, do what I do and you will sell. Uh, 
I think, Jesus, he's a genius. And then he said, eh, eh, sowing and reaping. I was like, yeah, that's exactly I tell all my sales reps as well. The more prospects you meet, the more you will sell. I think, Jesus, Jesus, you're so good. <laughs> and what happened? One thought started to came into my mind. And it was like, can this be true? Is it possible? Can, it, can the Bible be true? And um, I pushed that thought away and, and, and thought all the miracles, no, they are way out there that blind can see and, and you know, death can hear and so on. But the, the thought kept coming back to me, can this be true? Can this actually, can this have happened? Can Jesus have been alive and done all these things? So I decided to go in. I was at my mom's place. I, I went into a room. I closed the door. Pulled down the slides. Blinds, I mean. Slides. Uh, pulled down the <laughs> blinds. And I prayed my first prayer. Prayer. Jesus, do you exist? And bam! Nothing happened. <laughs> oh, did I feel stupid or not? You know, I was like, why did I pray? But God is so good. After a couple of weeks, this guy who gave me the Bible, he invited me to church meeting like this. Uh, not as great church as uh, Colonial, of course, but it was a good church. They have a meeting, worship, and everything. And I, at that, uh, that service, received Jesus. The, the, the message was so good, and I was like feeling in my heart, this is true. I wanted to give, give my life to Jesus. So there and then... I received Jesus. What an amazing thing. Unbelievable. <laughs> the problem was, I was living, I, this happened in Stockholm, and I lived in Gothenburg, that's really far from Stockholm. So when I went home, back to, back to my home, hometown, so I went into a couple of churches, and uh, there was uh, no welcome team or nothing there. So I went in alone. And I get out, get, get out from the church alone. And uh, I went in. It was not that there was something wrong with the church, but it didn't feel, I didn't feel at home. And uh, I, I went in alone, and I didn't meet anybody. I went out alone. So I lived in the desert for many years, like three, four years in the desert, where I believed in Jesus, but I lived my old life. And that, that is not a good place. So that's why I love a church like Colonial Church. That's why I love Hillsong, my home church. Because we, when people are walking in through those doors, we want to see the people that are walking in there. We want to welcome them. This is family. This is a home. This is a place where we can get, get restored. This is a place where we can be transformed. It's amazing. And I love that. I love the heart that uh, Matt and Jill has. It's all about people. It's not about anything. It's all about people getting new lives, getting freedom inside our hearts. I really love that. And that's what I'm burning for. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm on fire for. And after that, those years, I, I came to a point where I wanted to, you know, get to know Jesus. I didn't know him. I, I, I believed in him. I didn't know who, who was Jesus and how was it to live with him? What, what was that? So I started to pray a, pray, a prayer that I, the, that I, the only prayer I could pray was like, please, God, uh, help me find a mentor. Because I tried church, but it didn't work for me. So I, I prayed for a mentor. And just a short while after that, how good is God? I was at a hotel. I was eating breakfast. And a guy next to, to me on a table next to mine, he started to talk to me and say, hi, who are you? And what, what are you doing? And, you know. We had started to have a chat, and he was a great guy. We connected like this, and his name was John, and he lived in the same city as that I did. So we started to talk, and we decided to have a lunch when we came back to town. Came back to town, and we had a lunch, great lunch. We were eating, having fun, and after the lunch, he gives me a call. It was amazing, and he he says, Henry. This might sound strange, but I felt that God told me to offer you, I have a one-year Bible school material. I could come home to you once a week and walk you through this material. And please, if this feels really strange to you, uh, say no. I, I have no strings attached. I just want to help you if you want to. And I was like, yeah! 
yes! <laughs> it was unbelievable. This guy, this man, he actually traveled like one and a half hour to my home just to, to you know, fill me with the word of God. And I started to, you know, I trusted him and I started to share everything about my life. And uh, that was a long list uh, of not good things. And um, we prayed about it. And, you know, in the end, I got planted into his church. And I say, that's where I found freedom. That's where I found freedom. That's where Jesus actually came alive into my heart, where I started to, to follow him, wanted to have a relationship with him, where I, where I s- seeked him. And that was amazing. Then I went, I, I was on, on my way to business this, uh, uh, a couple of months later, and, you know, and I asked him, do you know any good church in London because I'm doing business there? No, he said, no, but my daughter lives there, he said. And so, okay, and she maybe can show you to a church. So I came to London, and I fell in love. <laughs> uh, and you, you should have seen his face when I came back. And I told him that I fell in love with in, in his daughter. He remembered the list. He <laughs> so, and who in the right sense of mind tells the becoming father-in-law the list? <laughs> you don't start with a list, do you understand? <laughs> That's like, that comes much later. That's not the first thing you do. So anyway... You understand, it's arranged marriage. No, yes, it was not arranged marriage. <laughs> it was the total opposite. He was, no, but he was, he, he believed in me. Unbelievable. I'm today married with his daughter. And, uh, I mean, God is good. Okay, I want to share a couple of points. How to live in the promised land. Is that okay? Uh, and number one, I think this, these points are not have tos. You, you have to do this. Want to do. It's an it's opportunity for us to live in the promised land as Christians. We all should live in the promised land because that's a land full with honey and milk for your family, for your business, for your workplace. Whatever you do, that's the best place. That's the best, best place for us to be in. And number one, to, to be in the promised land, I think we need to have a purpose. You know, when I, when I came here, uh, I, was, I landed in Orlando, and a guy named Jason picked me up, and that was awesome. And, you know, uh, we, we were in, from Orlando to here. We, it took like half an hour. It was unbelievable. <laughs> He's a fast driver. <laughs> I was thinking, is this an airplane again, or is this a car? <laughs> you know, I never prayed so much, you know, my whole my life. <laughs> I was like, please, God, let us land. Or no, let us hear. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. He's a great guy, Jason. I love you, Jason. You're awesome. And uh, he's a good driver. But <laughs> you don't believe me now. <laughs> Sorry, Jason. Yeah, I know. We, we have to talk about it afterwards. Yeah. No, but he's a great guy. But anyway, if you, if you drive on a, on a highway uh, and there is fog... So you, can't, so you can't see so clear. Then you have to slow down because you can't see. If the fog is so thick so you can't see anything, then you have to stop. And I think the, it's the same like the Bible says. If you don't have vision, it's really difficult to do anything. And the, the, the Bible says it clear. People without vision perish. And it's so easy for us Christians to be, get sidetracked when we don't have a purpose. And... What is the purpose? I was thinking long time, what is the purpose? Well, the Bible is quite clear about the, our purpose as Christians. It's, it's Matthew 28, 19. It's, uh, it's helping people to find Jesus and also help, helping them to get planted and transformed in a local church, getting discipleship. Then I was, uh, I'm a businessman, and you wonder, how can I have this purpose? And the best thing is that all of us in here have different giftings. We're not called, all of us, to work in the church. A lot of us are called to be out in the marketplace. And that is great because we can be the salt and light out in the marketplace. We can also build the house of God with our finances. And I think that's what I want to do. I'm a kingdom builder. I'm called to do that. I love to do that, be a part of something bigger than myself. I don't want to live just for me. God helped me 
uh, tremendously to transform my life. He has transformed your life and he will transform others' lives through you. Let us be a part of that. Have a purpose in what we do. And I just want to share just a, a short moment about when, when I was on my way to lose my purpose. And this man, John, he was, uh, he was my father-in-law. He was my pastor. Uh, he was my mentor and my extra dad. You know, I loved the, this man. And, and 16 years ago, he went to, to, to a doctor and he got diagnosed with cancer. And it was like a black hole for me opened up. I was like... What is happening? How can this happen to this man? Well, we started to pray, prayed for healing. We believed that everything is going to, to go so good. And uh, it took only three months before he, he, he passed away. And it was like, in my mind, it was like, God, how is this possible? Why? I had a big why in my head. And uh, I was devastated. I, this man meant so much to me, and he, and he passed away. Man of God, he had a family with five kids, and he was a pastor. In the midst of the darkness, God spoke to me one sentence that changed all my life again, all my perspective. And that sentence was like, he said, I, I heard a voice inside of me saying, Henry, let that John sowed into you of me, let that bear fruit. And it was like a switch turned on when I realized the only way to honor him was go out and bear fruit. He had sacrificed so much of his time to sow into my life. And the only way I could honor that was to actually go out and do that. Do what God, what he had put in of God into my heart. And I think it's the same today. How many people have sacrificed this for you and me in our lives? I mean, somebody has paid for the chairs we are sitting on. Somebody has paid for the building, the rent and everything. Somebody has sowed the word of God into you. Have sacrificed. It can be your parents. It can be a teacher. It can be whoever. And let us be the people who go out and bear fruit. Don't you think that that's the right thing to do, to honor the people that invested in us? I believe you're creating history here in this church. I've seen so many good people. I feel like this is my family. I want to move here. I want to live here. <laughs> it's so cold in Sweden. It's great here. You're doing something extraordinary here. God is doing something extraordinary through you guys. Through this church, through the leaders you have, I really encourage you to just keep on going and do, do this. You're, do, you're having a momentum. You know, momentum is a rare thing. It's nothing, it's, it's nothing that comes and goes. It's something you have to fuel and work towards and keep going. Keep the momentum going. What you're doing here is unbelievable. I'm getting excited. Is that Okay. <laughs> You thought Swedes were calm and relaxed and, you know, reserved, but I'm, I'm, I'm the opposite. I love to be here and love to talk to you guys. Unbelievable. Number two, I'm going to end with this, is we should build our lives on an unshakable foundation. Unshakable foundation. And I'm a builder. You know, uh, that's great. You know, G all of us know Jesus was a carpenter, and obviously he loves the construction business. That is awesome. I was thinking, if it's good enough for Jesus, it must be good for me. <laughs> I do the same. So, everybody, I want to give you a picture of when, as a builder, when you build a house, you have a foundation. And then you have, on the, on the foundation, that decides, if the foundation is good, the size of the building you may build on it. And the one factor that we often miss is that if the ground is soft or the soil is soft. So if you have a good foundation, good building, it can still tilt and even collapse and crash. And what do we do then as builders? Yes, we have to do piling. So we, we actually, piling is that you take steel pipes and you hammer them down into the ground, many of them, and then you put the foundation on top of them. And then it gets a solid construction. And you hammer those pipes down until they hit the rock. That makes the the thing solid. 
And the interesting thing about this is the foundation is done by humans. And the hammering is also done by us humans. But this construction doesn't get solid until it's connected with something made by God. How good is that? And I think it's the same with us. The promised land is when we are starting to build our life on God's promises. Isn't that good? The piling, that can illustrate the promises that we need to hammer those promises into us. So we actually believe them. So we trust them, trusting God in and connecting ourselves with God in our daily life. And I have, there is 3,000 promises in the Bible. And... Um, there is a promise for each one of us. It doesn't matter how different we are. We are not, we are not the same, all of us. So we, have, we can build our lives on different promises. I have five promises here I want to show you that I build my life on. I'm old school. I have a whiteboard. I mean, you, you're thinking, this, man, this, uh, this guy is really old. Yeah, I, I do this and... Wow! <laughs> I actually painted this. What do you say? <laughs> it's nice, isn't it? And this is the foundation, and this is the piles I build my life, life on. And um, I'm going to share a little bit about those piles. Is that okay for you? Romans 10, 17, the first pile. That is, so then faith can, it comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We need faith. We need, all of us believers, we need faith to in our daily lives. I, I need faith in my business. I want to have, you know, I take risk. I do investments. I don't know what, happen, know what happens in two years. But I, I need to do my due di di diligence. Is that right? Due diligence. And um, fear tells you you can't. Fear says that you're not enough. Fear tells you that you shouldn't do it. You know, faith it tells that you can, you're able to, I have put power in you. That is what we need. So we need daily to fill ourselves with, read the Bible and hear the God. Being here today, I think, increases our faith. When I listen to Matt's preaching, that, it, that increases our faith. When I read the Word of God, that increases my faith. I think that is essential for us as believers when we are out there in marketplace. And even where, wherever we are, we need faith. Number two, the, the second pillar, it's uh, James 4, 8. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. How good is it, isn't that? that uh, it's the only, only way to get closer to him is actually spend time with him, to have intimacy with God and, you know, pray, uh, read the Bible and talk to him in our daily life. And I want to have God as a partner in everything I do. I want to have him beside me, in me, through me, to do what I, I'm called to do. And I think it's the same with you. You should have God with you in everything you do and expect that he's there with you. But we need to spend time with him because otherwise, this Bible verse also says he, he, he's quite far away if we don't draw near to him. You know, he can't draw near to us if we don't draw near to him. He, he stands there with open, open arms and just waiting on us to come to him. It, how, how good isn't that to have a loving father that's always there receiving us? Number three is James 1, 5. It says, uh, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. And how good is that? I had to have a God that, that we, don't, we don't need to be brain scientists and rocket scientists. We can just ask God for wisdom. They say, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. Amen. Amen. I want to have God's wisdom. You know, Henry's ideas, they are good, but God's ideas, they are great. They are best. Uh, often Henry's ideas are not good actually so I want to have I want to have God's ideas and it's the same for you we need his ideas he knows the best way for us he knows how you you and me are going to flourish uh, and be what he what we are called to be and he has great plans and dreams for us and let plug into his wisdom in everything we do stay planted here that's wisdom you flourish. If you're planted in the God of house, you will flourish, the, the Bible says. And I really believe that. Number four is Matthew 5, 8. That is so awesome. God blesses those with pure hearts, for they will see God. Wow. 
I love that. That we, he, he wants to bless us. He wants to have blessing flowing through you and me. To us, through us. We are called, I think we're called, everyone, every one of us here, not to let the blessing stop in us. We're called to receive them. I believe that we should, we should receive God's blessing. But we're also called to give, give, give it away. Give it, let it pass through us. I think that's the whole God's ecosystem. It's about flowing to you, through you, blessing people, being living in a blessed life. Like we heard earlier here, uh, I think it was Chris who shared about when giving that, you know, life doesn't get smaller when we give. God promised our lives to get bigger when we give. How good isn't that? That's unbelievable. I want to have a pure heart, but the problem is I'm a human. I do mistakes, and we all do. We, 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 that's, that's life, and that's, my, that's why I want to have my fifth promise here. First John 1, 9. We have, we have to come back to that again and again and again. And the great thing is that if we do something wrong, uh, God never closes the door to us. He doesn't close, close the door to us. He stands there with open arms and says, come back into the promised land. Come back, son and daughter. We are family. Come back. You know, we are family. You are God's son and daughter here. And he says here in 1 John 1, 9, But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How good isn't that? I believe the promised land is a life built up on, upon God's promises. That is the promised land. The promises are different for each one of us. But I promise, uh, that's not the joke, that I promise that His promises, they are there forever. They are unshakable. They don't, you, they don't get different tomorrow they are there forever for us to build our lives on have a solid foundation we can meet challenges and I just want to end with what, what, uh, what a word from God where he says in Matthew 7 24 therefore everyone who hears this word of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock on the rock the rain came down, streams rose, and the winds blew, beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it's, it had its foundation on the rock. Hey guys, let us build this church. Let us be pillars, all of us. Build, it, build our lives on a solid foundation. We plant it in, in this church and, and do what God ever has called us to do. Thank you for today. I really appreciate you being here. Lovely. <laughs> Well, hey, I hope you received something from that message. I wonder if you've ever received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'd love to include you in a prayer. The Bible tells us that all we have to do is believe in our hearts, confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord, that God raised Him from the dead and we are saved. We actually don't have to do anything except receive this beautiful gift from God. So I wonder if you've ever made that choice to invite Jesus in. I would love to lead you in a prayer right now. Why don't you just repeat after me? Dear Jesus, Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died for me and you rose again. Forgive me of my sins. Of all the things I've done wrong, I choose today to be a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. We really believe in that moment, if you pray that prayer from your heart, you move from not knowing God to knowing God. You're saved. And we would love to help you in any way we can in the journey. Please reach out to us at colonialchurch.life and we'll do everything we can to help you on this beautiful new journey of faith. God bless you.